Um, my name is Ruth Holloway. Most of you know me or have seen me wheeling around here um, for the last several years uh, that I've been doing this. I've been part of the Pearl community actively since 2012. Uh, I've been writing Pearl since about 2002-ish, um, professionally, making money. Over the course of my 30-something, 30, 30 years career, um, I've made money writing software in six different languages. Um, and, and, you know, what they say about consultants is, is kind of halfway true. If you can't be part of the solution, there's substantial money to be made in, con in prolonging the problem. Um, so programmers who can work in dead languages, and I deliberately put those quotes around dead because we'll see why in a minute, um, can make a lot of money keeping organizations working on old code. Um, and there's a lot of old code out there. Uh, most of the global financial system is written on old, old, old code, but it works so they don't mess with it. Um, I saw an article on Slashdot the other day. The New York City subway system runs on OS2. OS2 is the operating system that runs it. Uh, India Railways for years and years and years was running on Vax VMS. Yeah. Way after OpenVMS came out, way after Hewlett Packard bought all that and started doing away with VMS, they were still running Vax VMS 5.0 because it worked and they couldn't afford the downtime to move to something else. Yeah. Fair warning, there's a lot of text on the slides ahead. I'm not going to quiz you about it. But I hope you pick up some bits along the way. And if you want the slides, come see me after and I'll send you a copy. Um, Is it a dad joke if it's a mom that does it? Is it a dad joke if it's a mom that does it? Really? Does it count the same way? Okay, just fair. All right, I used to write for opensource.com. Most of you know that. I've, I've preached about it a few times. I saw an article on opensource.com earlier this week, and I got a little cranky with my former colleagues there. I, I quit writing mostly for personal reasons. It didn't have anything. I wasn't angry with them or anything. But I'm a little cross with the, the article that came out because they, they actually posted this article. And there's about, I don't know, eight or ten languages on this list, and Perl's one of them. So please go to this link and stack the deck. There's a poll there. What's your favorite dead language? Go to this link, click Perl, and submit. Uh, Perl was third when I looked an hour ago, behind C and Pascal. Surely we can do better than this. What's your favorite dead language? Um, one of the other commenters, who is a past keynoter at this conference, said she was extremely disappointed with this article. It was really poorly done, and, and I said, thank you, Vicki. I agree with you. Um, and I wrote, well, I'm actually at the Pearl Conference in Pittsburgh, and I'll be talking about dead languages tomorrow. I wrote that yesterday. Um, go stack the deck on them. That's what they get for posting such a shoddy thing. Um, we're going to talk a little about history. How did we end up in the situation we're at with dead languages. Um, all of the earliest computers were one-off constructs. They were individual artifacts. Most of us know that, and if you've ever been to, you know, Air and Space or, or some of the other technology museums, you've seen, you know, one of the frames from ENIAC, which is this refrigerator-sized thing that had 12 bytes of storage. Um, most of us know about that kind of concept. Uh, prior to 1942, all of them included mechanical components, relays, things that move, physical things that move around. Um, the first totally electronic digital computer was the ABC in 1942. It used tubes, lots and lots and lots of tubes. Um, Colossus was the first one that was digitally programmable. It used tape, uh, pa punched paper tape to program it, and that was at Bletchley Park. It was used during World War II. Uh, and cracked codes from the Axis powers. Post-World War II, the needs of computing started to change because people realized that it isn't just the military who needs computers. We started to figure out that there were other things you could use these for. Um, ENIAC was the first computer built in the US. People talk about ENIAC being the first computer. No, it was just the first one built in the States. And it implemented code branching instructions, a rudimentary form of if then, else. This is the first computer that did if-then-else. 
but it was hard coded. You had to flip switches and punch wires down and to write programs. Writing programs took hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of people's time, mostly women, punching in all this stuff. The Manchester Mark I, or the Madam, in 1949, uh, was a prototype for the Ferranti Mark I, which was the first commercially available that wasn't part of an academic research project or a military project. And the first Ferranti booted in 1951. The first commercial computer. And, and remember, it's you know, the size of this room. It's massive machines. Um, Univac One was the first commercial computer produced in the States. Remington Rand did that, the Rand Corporation, one of their descendants. First booted in March of 1951. We were only a month behind the Brits in that. Um, then came the push to get rid of all the tubes. Tubes were a huge problem. They're unreliable as all get out, uh, relatively speaking, certainly in today's modern terms, they're completely unreliable. They're good for producing really nice sound in an amp, and that's about it. Um, so the first fully transistorized computer was the Harwell Cadet, and they, they also pointed out that this was a much smaller machine because it got rid of all the tubes. Um, it was only half the size of this room. Uh, integrated circuits started on embedded systems. We did this first on ballistic missiles. That was where we first built integrated circuits, or what we would consider today's integrated circuits. That started with the Minuteman. Um, that was the first flight control system that was containable on the platform that was done with. Now, realize, look at the dates on this. The Apollo program had already started. Mercury was already almost over by this time. What kind of computers were on Apollo, on Mercury, on Gemini? These were, it, it, it is amazing, frankly, that anybody lived to get to space and back. Um, there's a book coming out, I think, next month. A guy writes a book about how improbable it was because when Kennedy said, by the end of the decade, we want to get to the moon and bring somebody back, nobody in NASA thought it was even possible. They had none of the bits available. There was no computer small enough to fit on top of a rocket to shoot all the way to the moon. They didn't even know what kind of rocket they needed to build to do that. And so this whole book is about the improbability of pulling this off, and yet they did. And um, uh, the, process, the microprocessor, the 4004, changed everything because it was mass producible and it was cheap. It was reasonable and small. Everybody thinks the first language was COBOL. That's not correct. That's, that, is, that is an incorrect thing. We have all these, these legends about COBOL and, and all the great things that Grace Hopper did and all, you know, the first language that spoke English and the first language and she did it by herself and all of those are untrue. All of those facts are completely untrue. Fortran was the first language. It was specified in 1954 by IBM. Uh, the first compiler was for the IBM 701 machine, 1957. It was the first compiler that optimized in any modern way at all. And it basically did that through disposing of variables that were no longer in scope. That was the only optimization it really knew how to do. By 1960, compilers for it were available for a bunch of different IBM machines. By 63, over 40 different compilers existed, but realize each of those compilers worked on very different machines. We didn't have standard platforms like the x86 platform then, so an IBM 709 was a completely different animal from a 701. So if you were going to write a, a program on Fortran, you wrote it for Fortran on this machine. And if you wanted to port that, you rewrote it for the new machine because the implementation was completely different. Uh, it's still in use. Scientific and supercomputing finds it really, really useful, even though until the 80s it couldn't do recursion at all. When I started college, you could not do recursion in Fortran. Say again? It's a pretty different language than what it was. Yeah, it has moved quite a bit from that point. Yeah. And it influenced a bunch of other languages that are also all still in use. 
Uh, MUMPS is a largely database-driven language. It's digital standard MUMPS for the longest time, and now uh, inner systems MUMPS. It's used a lot in, in medical stuff. Uh, LabCorp was using it for years and years and years. I worked for them for a while. Lisp was, not, was the second language. COBOL wasn't the second language either. Um, Lisp was. Um, practical mathematical notation. Mathematical notation that looked like the mathematical notation that you and I use in school. That was what Lisp brought. Was the ability to write math the same way we do with a pencil. It was the first dynamically typed functional language. It was first implemented on the 704 in 1958. The complete pi compiler implementation in its own language came a few years later. That was the first language that anybody did that with. Re-implement a compiler in the language you're going to compile. It's like writing a Perl interpreter in Perl. Um, a lot of implementations of Lisp, and many are still, are still maintained. Still active, common Lisp, closure, scheme, those are still around. Still in use in the AI community. And they influenced a lot of languages. And you might be seeing some languages that start to look a little like Perl. There's this convergence on, on the kinds of languages we write. COBOL wasn't the third language either. <laughs> that was Algol. It was written for the Z22 in December of 58. IBM a template implementation, but they gave up on it because they were working on Fortran already. The standard upgrade was to Algol 60. Nobody much uses 58 for very long because 60 came around and it was huge. And it introduced code blocks as we think of them today with, big, with discrete begin and ends. And it strongly influenced basically all imperative language that followed. Pascal, C, Perl, B, PL1, and so on. Okay, who's this lady sitting at the desk? Anybody know her? No? No? Okay. Well, let me show you a little newer picture of her. Because you can tell this is from a long time ago, because that's a single computer behind her, right? Um, maybe you know her this way. <clears throat> Rear Admiral Dr. Grace Murray Hopper, United States Navy. Um, the first woman to be an admiral without ever commanding a ship. Um, yeah, one of the oldest people to serve in the Navy and retired on the oldest Navy ship. Um, so she joined UNIVAC in 1949, and she presented the idea to her team that a computer language could use English words as operative words and have a program that compiled them, she did coin the word compiling, into machine code. And the idea was to make source code that was compatible across multiple machines and multiple implementations of the compiler so that you could move your user end program from machine to machine to machine without having to completely rewrite it every single time like you did with Fortran at the time. Um, so she re they told her she couldn't do it. Wasn't possible. Don't be silly, computers don't speak English. They still don't, but you know. So Grace Hopper being Grace Hopper, she took that advice and went and did it and uh, wrote the A0 system language which was the first compiler. It's actually more like a modern linker, we would think of it, um, in 1952. And then she came out with Flowmatic, the V0 language, in 1955. It used English-like terms. It looks a little like COBOL. If you go and look at some Flowmatic code, you will see very COBOL-ish code. And then in 1960, uh, the Defense Department wanted a portable language. And, and, you know, Remington Rand and the other companies said, well, you know, we've got this really clever woman who's been working on this stuff for a couple of years, even though we told her no. Um, <laughs> so they formed Codicil, a committee. Okay, how many things designed by committee work? Besides COBOL, <laughs> right? Designed by committee, let's see. Okay, that's real good. They formed to develop it in 1959. The first compiler was August 17th on an RCA 501. The same program, the same source code was run on a UNIVAC three months later. 
demonstrating the portability that the Defense Department wanted and that Grace Hopper had said was possible all along. And it only took her 12 years and a committee to do the third version of it that got us there. You may be right. I, I think uh, it's probably true. By 70, it was the most used language in the world. And if you go out, does anybody in the room not have a debit card or a credit card in your pocket? I mean, most everybody does these days. Go out and swipe it 10 times before the end of the day. By midnight, seven of those transactions will have been touched by COBOL code somewhere in the world. Guaranteed. That's the mathematical average. Doesn't matter what bank you're using, doesn't matter what country you're from, doesn't matter where in the world you swipe that card, statistically, seven out of 10 of those transactions will be touched by COBOL before midnight. It's still a lot of code. In the 60s and 70s, there was a lot of refinement. APL in 62 introduced array programming. BASIC in 64 was the first teaching language. God help us with teaching languages that got out into the street. BASIC and Pascal, I shall say. Uh, Simula in 1967 was the first that actually did anything that we would call object-oriented, but it didn't do much. Uh, C, 69 through 73 was the development time for that. System programming language, early Unix was using that. We all know about C. Pascal was the first teaching language that, that really shouldn't have gotten out onto the street. <laughs> but it did. Because it was a good teaching language. And, you know, uh, a friend asked me a while back, why, why use a language just for teaching? Well, if you were in Fortran, Part of the syntax is spaces. And you could get wrapped around the axle with the, the syntax and not learn the important concepts. The nice thing about Pascal was it was kind of friendly to sloppy syntax. You could get away with a lot. Like not having a semicolon on the last line of a block. What other language do we know that lets you do that? And not caring about spacing and how you indent things. And oh, we, we don't know any languages like that, do we? I mean, the only thing that cares about spacing in Perl is that, uh, you know, Damien. <laughs> Perl critic. Um, Smalltalk, the first object-oriented language, 1972. Oops, I skipped Prolog, the first logic language that had extensive logical operators that we'd never had before. Binary or, and those kinds of things. In the 80s, um, by, the, by the early 80s, the Department of Defense had over 450 languages in use. All right, a lot of people don't realize, if you go and look at Wikipedia's list of notable computer programming languages, there are over 750 entries, each one of which has its own Wikipedia page. And that doesn't count weird edge cases like law code and, you know, stuff like that. Go to Rosetta Code and you can see Languages you probably never heard of. And as soon as you look at the code, you'll go, God help me, I never have to do it. All right, this was the problem the Department of Defense defaced, and so they developed, with some help, um, Ada, in an effort to unify that, and of course it was named after Ada Lovelace. Um, standard expression of documents for laser printers, Postscript, 1982. We just think of that as ubiquitous now, but Hand, have you ever hand-hacked PostScript? Ooh, it's painful, isn't it? It is gruesome. And I'm not talking about using the PDF mangling modules that we have in CPAN. I'm talking about hand-hacking it. Oh, I only did it once, and I'm like, never again. MATLAB? Want big number crunching and don't have to want to learn Fortran? MATLAB. And of course, that influenced R and Julia and some other things. Uh, C++, extended C with object-oriented programming tools, and hey, we know these guys. That was the original impetus for Perl. He was using awk and said, but there's this command line limit. You can only put so much on the command line. And he wanted to do more than that, but it does the same stuff, only without the limit. That was the original impetus behind Perl. And to hear Larry talk about it is a joy, if you ever get a chance to just sit and chat with him about it. And so many more. 
And these are just kind of big ones. You've probably heard of most of these, right? These are just the big ones. We need to talk about dead languages. What is a dead programming language? Clearly that article I posted earlier doesn't have a real good idea what dead is. But for the sake of our morning, let's throw out a working definition. It's not taught anywhere. There are no or very few new developers, maybe some hobbyists, but not many, and nobody doing it professionally for ongoing maintenance work. No vendors or open source communities that are supporting compilers and interpreters. No new developments in the standards or functionality, and little or no production code. Right there, the last one is the kicker. Hmm? Except there are no dead languages. Bingo, got it in one. There are no dead languages. The case could be made for Modula 2. But it was DOA, mostly. It didn't get taught very many places, and not for very long. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Defense Department still uses Zeta. They've enhanced the language, and they keep doing new stuff with it, but they still use it. Um, is COBOL dead? Well, I think we've kind of talked about this. It's not taught in schools, uh, but there is new development in the language. Uh, new COBOL had a, had a new version out a while back. I need to check and see if they've got another one. I haven't looked in a while. Um, and Microfocus is still supporting COBOL in a, in a commercial interpreter, and in commercial compiler. Um, the 2014 standard Codasil still exists. That committee of grumpy old farts and Grace Hopper still exists, and they're still updating the language. You can do object-oriented programming in COBOL. There are web libraries for COBOL. I, can't, I, I looked at a web library for COBOL, and I'm like, it's like a really clunky dancer with three left feet. <laughs> it's really, really awkward, but they can do it, you know. And, and tables in, in COBOL, if you, ever, if you ever try to learn COBOL, if you define a table, you have to define its size from the beginning until the 2014 standard. You can now have dynamically sized tables. Ooh, yeah, that is big. But there's the kicker. There is a bucket load of production code out there in COBOL today. Now, I know a few COBOL devs. The average age of a COBOL developer now is like 58 or 60. It's coming up on retirement age. And the ones that I know are all making six digits. And one of them's making a half million dollars a year working about seven months out of the year. Out of his house, maintaining COBOL for banks and financial institutions and insurance companies. Things that do money, which is where COBOL excels. COBOL's very good at that. Um, so this should tell you, you know, if you're younger than that 60 years old, um, you could pull the average way down <laughs> and you could make a lot of money. There is a lot of money to be made in doing that if you're any good at all. Um, so learning a new language can benefit you, right? Um, so I hear this all the time, X is a dead programming language, and my contention is for any X, that statement is untrue for any X. A very, very few teaching languages, maybe. I, I mentioned Modula 2 a little bit ago. I taught that for one semester in a lab at the little tiny university I went to, and then they did away with the class. They only taught it for two semesters, and I was the lab instructor for one of them. And, and then they, they're like, this language is worthless, and they quit doing it. Um, and I think that was, you know, because it was a descendant of Pascal, right? It was done by the same guy that did Pascal. And they said, oh, better teaching language. No, no, no. Um, I hear people bag on other programming languages a lot. And I'm cranky about it. This is my cranky face. All right, a couple years ago, I was at a Pearl conference in North America. And we were sitting around some big round tables. And there was a bunch of devs sitting there. And they were bagging on PHP. And I thought that was kind of interesting. And I sat down at the table with them and just listened for about 15, 20 minutes. And they're bagging on PHP. And they're bagging on PHP developers and the PHP community. And all, not going to name names. You know who you are. And finally, one of them had the presence of mind to say, you know, I wonder, do they bag on Perl developers as much as we bag on them? And I said, yes, we do. <laughs> and they went, oh. And they were suddenly enlightened. 
As a Buddhist, I look at that and go, enlightenment. Ta-da. Hating on computer languages and their communities, number one, is divisive and it alienates people that are in the same business you are. Look, we're about making people's lives easier with code. That's what we do, right? Anybody not do that? Anybody here at codes and makes lots of money just for the sheer lark of it? Or does it to make things hard? Shut up, Steve. <laughs> Sit down, Steve. Button it. <laughs> or who does it to make people's lives harder? I know you work at cPanel. It's okay. <laughs> if you're... If you're in it to make people's lives harder, frankly, you've picked the wrong career. I really pity you. But we're all in the business of writing code that should make people's lives easier, that make lives better, that make our world work better. Thank you. And, and if you're being divisive and being rude to your peers who are wanting the same thing you are, what's up with that? Really? It treats some developers as inferior based not on their skill, not on how long they've been doing it, but on what language they use. Oh, that's one of those basic programmers. Look, the first library automation system I ever worked on was all written in VAX basic. I pitched a wall I'd fit the first time I crashed it because it, it would tell you it was written in basic. The basic compiler had crashed and I'm like, basic? They wrote this in basic? I'm like, we can speed it up by a factor of three just by switching to C, right? But the developer who had written it, who was a librarian who's kind of nerdy, um, had written it in basic. Don't treat other developers as inferior just because of the languages they choose. All languages were written for a specific solution, for a specific problem set. Your language may or may not be suitable for all problem sets. If everything looks like a nail, your only tool starts to look like a hammer, right? And it's probably artificially generated. A lot of people talk about Perl being dead, and that is completely artificially generated. They've looked at some like Perl 3 or Perl 4 level code, and they go, ah, line noise. No, they haven't looked at modern Perl, which, by the way, is 10 years old. It's time they quit babbling a 10-year-old trope. But we're not going to get them to do that. This, this hatred is often artificially generated. People talk about PHP being inherently insecure. Maybe earlier versions had problems, but they've been working on it, just like we have. It's rude and disrespectful. They have put the work into their passion, just like you do. All right. How many CPAN authors do we have in the room? You have one or more modules on CPAN. You have at least some level of passion about having done that. You think it's valuable or you wouldn't have done it, right? Unless it's just purely ACME. It predates ACME, but it's... It's ACME, okay. <laughs> and then there's Jim Bacon in the back who wrote ACME dice and put loaded dice on CPAN. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, you care enough to have done that. They care about... PIP and NPM and the other tool repositories that they have in their tool chain. They care about that stuff too. Why are you being rude to them about things they care about? That's just unempathetic and ugly. And really, why do I have to tell you this? But I keep feeling like I have to do because I keep hearing this. So why should you learn another language? Given all this, and maybe you've gotten over some of the nastiness you think about whichever language you were hating on when you came in the door, there is no one perfect language for all the things. We've covered that. Not every problem is soluble with the same tool or soluble in the same way with the same tool. Maybe there's a better way to solve it using a different tool. Yes, you can pry a nail out with a screwdriver. No, that is not the best tool for the job. It's liable to get you hurt. Yes, you can pry a nail out with a saw. No, that will probably not give you the result you want. Right tool for the job. Understand your problem sets. Understand the kinds of problems you're trying to solve. And that leads to the right set of tools, perhaps. You're learning to think differently. 
especially if the language that you are trying to add on is from a different part of the family tree of languages. If you're doing COBOL or Fortran or um, R or Julia, um, you're picking up something that doesn't look a whole lot like Perl. Now, if you're picking up, if you're in Perl, you can learn PHP and Python real easily. Why? Because they look a lot alike. And they talk a lot alike. And you can probably get along in C pretty well, too, which means you can get along in C++ pretty well, too, if you wanted to. Learning those is not hard because they're kind of in the same branch of the family. But go learn COBOL or Fortran or uh, Julia, and you're, you're picking up something that's a big departure from that. So you learn to think in different patterns, which is always valuable, as our keynoter yesterday pointed out. You have these maladaptive patterns. The one he didn't list was the pattern that is a pattern. We've always done it this way. Let's do it this way. All problems are soluble this way. No, they're not. Learning to think in different ways is a good idea. It invests in your skill set. Like I said, you can make a lot of money. There was a poll taken in the UK three or four years ago and developers who knew two or more languages and considered themselves fluent. Now, this was not measured anyway, but the, the developer being interviewed said, I consider myself fluent in two programming languages. On average, made six to $10,000 more than their peers who only knew one. You want a six to $10,000 jump? Anybody? I guess you don't, Never mind. It's great, I'm out. Okay. Y'all don't care about this. You get to meet and work diff with different groups of people. I love this community. Anybody not love the pro community? Well, okay. We won't ask that one. Don't, don't answer that. I love this community. There are people in this community that I'm closer to than anybody except my husband. Um, this community is one of the great treasures in my life. And I mean that. Um... But there are other great communities out there. Other language communities are also good people just like you and me and everyone else at this conference. They're good people just like us. They have, you know, families and concerns and cares about their language and care about their compiler and care about their, their tool chain as much as we do. And they're wonderful people just like us. It's, we're not the only wonderful people on earth. Right? Have we ever been? But which one do you want to learn? Well, think about what you want to do. You need to know your tools. What, what are the problems you're trying to solve? If you want to write iPhone apps, well, Swift is probably a good choice. Gene Hack did a thing on Swift a couple of years ago that was really good. And of course, he included a bunch of Taylor Swift jokes because he's Gene Hack. And yeah, but learn Swift. If you want to write Android apps, Java, you may want to do that in Go as well. That's kind of a new development. Build a website. JavaScript. I know some of you consider it a dirty word, but we've talked about that now, haven't we? CSS, HTML5, learn that stuff. You want to write Windows desktop apps, C Sharp. 2D and 3D games, JavaScript, C Sharp, C++, those are the ways to go. You want to go into embedded things, Internet of Things stuff, probably C. A lot of that's done in C. Or I've seen a lot of stuff for the Raspberry Pi done in Python. I've seen a lot of Python out there. Because um, I have some Raspberry Pis at home. I'm doing some cool stuff and having fun with it. And, and I'm not writing new code. I'm just using other people's stuff. And a lot of it's in Python. Um, scientific, big data, Julia, Python, R, MATLAB. Those are um, commonly used today. And if you want to make a lot of money re maintaining old, old code, Fortran, of course, is your number of choice. Automation and scripting, oh, you've got choices. And of course, um, you know, Perl is really good at that kind of thing. Now, Perl's not bad at some of these other things. But those other languages might, for some problems, be better. So take a look. How do you go about learning a new language? Oh, where do you start? Well, just like the Perl community, we have lots of books. And if that's the way you learn, well, swell. That's a good place to start. And try to find the newest ones you can. Because just like if you pick up a book on Perl 508, um, sorry. 
Um, there's some hands-on tools online. Exorcism, HackerRank, and Educative. Um, Exorcism and Hacker, HackerRank both have about 50 languages covered. And it sets of problems where they give you this list of problems and you figure out how to solve them in each of these languages. Um, they also have some tutorials on the languages, some kind of base case stuff so that you learn how the language is structured, and what the syntax looks like, and all that. Educative is a relatively new entrant into this market. So look primarily for new languages on that one, not the old legacy languages. Um, disclaimer, I have spoken with Educative. They want me to write Perl content for them. Yeah, so there's going to be some Perl courses on Educative. There's one there now that they wrote internally, and I found a bug in their Hello World. Um, what? Well, their platform lets them run. When you create a block of code, you tell it what language it's in, and on the page they told that it was Python. It's Perl code, but it won't run because they're telling it to run it under the Python compiler. And so, yeah, I found a bug, but it's not a Perl bug. It's just... Yeah, it's a platform bug. Sorry, David. I'm sorry to panic you that way. <laughs> but you, you, Hello World is different in Perl and Python, and just a tiny, tiny difference. And, and you can't run one in the other. Um, I'm going to be writing Perl content for them starting this fall, probably. Um, I'm, theirs is a very basic, I've never touched Perl, start with Hello World, variables, and they did it internally, and they don't have any Perl experts. So I'm going to review that content and see if there's any upgrades they really ought to make. And then I'm going to set off with some intermediate things, and, and, um, and I'd also like to set off with some of the common modules. Things that I use, Dibbix class, Dancer, Template Toolkit, those sorts of things, start with those, and hopefully we'll find some other authors who might want to do that. And by the way, it's free to get on the platform and write, and you get royalty when people buy the courses. If you're interested, come talk to me. I will set you up with somebody. Um, college courses. If it's a modern language, a reasonably modern language that's still being taught in a college, go audit a class. Most audits, even, at, even with the outrageous inflation of education these days, audits are still reasonably cheap at most colleges. Uh, plus, there's a vast number of online things. Um, who was it? Was it MIT or somebody else that released all their computer science courses? Open courseware. Yeah. There's a ton of stuff. Um, Khan Academy. There's a bunch of things out there looking online for online not hands-on, online lecture kind of things, besides the hands-on tools like Exorcism and HackerRank. Now, I know, how many of you have your current job and you had to use HackerRank to solve some puzzle while you were doing it? Right, I didn't. Um, it, there's a reason. Okay, I said don't hate on languages, but hating on ha that use of hacker rank, I, I'm going to give you a pass on that one because that's just awful. That, it's not hacker rank. It's the notion that somebody that's not part of our company could write a puzzle for you to solve, and we use that to decide whether you're a good programmer or not. No. Ask me afterwards how Clearbuilt hires developers. I like our way better, and it doesn't involve hacker rank. Um, but do what works for you. Everybody learns different ways. Some of us learn by clattering away on the code. Some of us learn by clattering away on somebody else's code. And uh, GitHub, you can find somebody else's code there. Uh, some of us learn by books, by videos, name it. It's out there, even for really old languages. Talk about fluency. I mentioned this earlier in that poll. What is fluent? Oh, that's tough. And that's why HackerRank is such a stupid idea. Because it's testing something and claiming it's fluency. Um, it lets you get comfortable with the language. Can you read somebody else's code comfortably? Can you use its tool chain? OK, if you're learning Python, you need to understand PIP. Because it's the CPAN of Python, sort of. If you're using Node, the NPM. You need to know how the package repositories work. You need to know the strengths and weaknesses of the language. Like prior to the 80s, if you're needing something that does recursion, don't use Fortran. Know the strengths and weaknesses of the language. Now, one of the great strengths of COBOL is that it reads like English. So you can add insult to injury. <laughs> and that's a perfectly valid COBOL statement. Insult and injury are both variables. 
So you add insult to injury, and that's injury plus equals insult in Perl. All right. Uh, one of its great weaknesses is you type your fingers down to little nubbins writing any because it's very wordy. Be able to read others' code and make sense of it. Thank you. Be f you know, depending on what you're planning to do with it, being familiar with or comfortable with may be enough to feel good about it. Maybe may, it might feel good enough to let you go apply for that contracting job or, or work with another developer on maintenance of something. That's really, the, the, and that's why they asked the question, are you fluent in this? And said, by your own definition, are you fluent in this? Because it is very subjective. There are perils, and one of them is the possibility of community rejection. Um, I know somebody who tried to get involved in Tickle. They were absolutely horrid to her, partly because her. Bunch of grumpy old farts. I get it. But they were horrible to her, and she quit doing that. Don't do that, because they were just awful. Um, that is a possibility. There are others. Brain confusion. Hey, which languages have switch or case and which don't? And until you are typing on Perl and try to type switch um, and catch yourself with that before you try to run the program, um, then you haven't mastered one or the other. Not knowing what to do with all the extra money. Um, just saying. Loss of free time. Look, hey, if you're learning another language, it takes time. And, and you're going to get passionate about some project or another. Obviously, somebody was crazy enough to think we needed a web dancer type library in COBOL. And you know whoever that was had to have spent a book load of time doing that. Your family may hate you for your new passion. Just saying. I really appreciate you coming out. I, I you know, I hear rage about other languages and articles like the one that came out Sunday and they frustrate me because this is one legacy. It's not the legacy of just Perl over the last 20 years. It's the legacy of software development over 80 years that we should be celebrating more than we do. Um, we're coming up on a century of computer programming. Some of us will still be involved in our careers when we hit a century of computer programming. And I think it's amazing what we have changed, what people like you and me have changed in the last 80 years that even the people who did it early on couldn't have dreamed of. Grace Hopper said in one of her last speeches, you know, a phone that isn't wired to the wall. Now in her days, the cell phone was a big boxy thing in a bag, right? About the time she died was when that was kind of on the way out. That was a marvel. Think about all the things that Queen Elizabeth II has seen during her reign. Keep being a part of that. Preserve that history. Preserve that legacy. And keep doing it. Keep doing what you're doing because it's good stuff. Thank you all for your time here today. I appreciate you being here. Go in peace.